The Nigerian Center for Disease Control, NCDC, has released a situational report of cholera cases in Nigeria. And we've invited Dr. Emmanuel Okafo um, to discuss this with us. Good morning, Dr. Okafo. Hello, good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thanks for joining us. The NCDC is reporting over 70,000 cholera cases in Nigeria and over 2,300 2, deaths in 25 states and the FCT. Do you think Nigerians mm -hmm. understand the gravity of this situation? Uh, to a large extent, I don't think the general populace has you know, a full grasp of what is going on um, in the community in terms of uh, the cholera outbreaks because uh, the number of suspected cases and, of course, the number of suspected deaths have been on the rise for you know quite a while now. Um, right from, like you said, right from January to first up to now, over 70,000 deaths, over 2,000, sorry, over 70,000 suspected cases and over uh, 2,000 deaths, which is quite a significant amount, uh, you know, when you look at, you know, the number that we actually detect. So um, I think important information is to be passed to the public, public concerning what is going on. And, you know, I believe that's what we're doing right here. And this will go uh, a really large way. Okay. All right. Talk, talk a little bit more about what cholera is and how it is spread. Because if we're talking about 25 states, uh, does it yeah. mean that the water in 25 states in Nigeria currently, you know, are, okay. you know, infected? Yeah. Um, so okay, what exactly yes, is cholera and how is it spread? Okay, yes. What cholera is? Cholera is primarily a waterborne disease, right? It is an intestinal infection uh, caused by a certain bacteria. The, it's the passage of high amounts of watery diarrhea. Okay, um, here is you know, some of the signs in which one might suspect they have cholera uh, is uh, the watery diarrhea, like we said, large, large amounts. Uh, it may start off with you may start off with having some stool in it, right? Some fecal matter in it. But, you know, as it progresses, because uh, cholera can have a clinical manifestation within two to three, four, five days of, you know, it getting started. So, um, apart from the water diet, you could have uh, uh, nausea. That's the feeling of wanting to vomit. You could actually vomit. And like I said earlier, we start off of, as just watery stool, and you're still seeing some materials that suggest it's stool. But as it progresses and as it gets worse, it just becomes like a white opaque fluid, right? Like uh, we usually liken it to rice water, the water that you get after you wash um, rice or when you want to cook rice. When you notice your stool has become like that, right? And you're seeing that it is really, really, uh, the amount you're getting is really, really large. Uh, there's a high chance that you know, cholera is ongoing. And like I said, it's an infection with a certain kind of bacteria. Yeah, but how, how is it, how is it, you know, um, how, how does cholera spread? Is it through dirty okay, water yes. or through food? Yes. Yeah, okay. Cholera spreads uh, through uh, contaminated food and contaminated water. So it goes uh, uh, both ways, right? So once you have water because uh, you have the, the organism that is causing it primarily, right? It dwells, it has a hum human reservoirs and water reservoirs, those are the two primary reservoirs in which you have them. So once, you know, you, you have contact with someone, you know, that, you know, has, let's say someone that has cholera, right, goes ahead to prepare your food because cholera is not always symptomatic. You don't always have symptoms from cholera, right? So you could have somebody, so just imagine a food seller who has cholera, but it's not showing any symptoms. Um, constantly preparing food for people. She's not washing her hands. She's not following good hygiene practices. You will just have, uh, you know, cholera spread to a whole lot of people. Also, places that have, you know, poor access to water, clean water. Um, you could have, you know, a body of water that is, you know, widely contaminated with the organism, and they just take it in, right? And we experience this in certain parts of Nigeria where open defecation is common practice, right? People just go to large bodies of water and, you know, you know, dump the excreta there. When someone goes ahead to drink that water, right, no boiling, no chlorination, nothing to take care of the water, um, the person consuming such water, consuming such food, food as earlier described, yes, could get uh, cholera. So that is how it spreads. 
Okay, I want you to tell us more about how it spreads because I've spoken to other medical practitioners and they also mm -hmm. emphasized on seafood and how it should be prepared mm -hmm. to avoid cholera. Please tell us more about that. Okay, when it comes to uh, seafood, you could have it, but we notice, you know, sometimes things like crabs, uh, you could have um, you could have the, the bacteria, the organism causing it, uh, stay in those kind of organisms in water bodies. Uh, so the primary thing there is to make sure if you're taking seafood that you boil it well, right? Emphasis on boiling. For example, in crabs, uh, for people eating crabs, it's been demonstrated that, you know, if you boil it for up to uh, 10 minutes, if you boil the crab for up to 10 minutes, the likelihood of you getting cholera is super low. But even though if you just deviate from that a little bit, right, we have still seen uh, cholera, you know, in significant quantities in, in, um, uh, in crabs that are boiled over a shorter period of time than 10 minutes, right? Stay eight minutes, we still see some growth of the of the bacteria. But 10 minutes, uh, generally, you're good to go in, in boiling your seafood. Oh. That's in addition to you know, what I mentioned earlier, how people could get it. You mentioned yeah, well. crabs. How about fishes? Do we also need to take such precaution? Especially when you drive around Lagos, you know, these bridges, you see um, fishermen, you know, putting their, their hook and bait mm -hmm. into the water and, yeah. you know, they, they catch these fishes, people buy them on the roadside. Do we also need mm -hmm. to take such precautions? So, so generally, right, whatever is going into your mouth, whatever is going into your, into your, uh, into your body, uh, through your mouth, especially as it pertains to food, right? Once it's edible, once you're thinking of consuming it, you want to make sure that it is appropriately cooked or appropriately boiled, right? This can't be uh, overemphasized because, uh, you know, doing le less than is necessary, doing less than you should could lead to, you know, one getting cholera, of course. Okay. Now let's talk about managing cholera. We're hearing about 70,000 cases, uh, 2,300 yeah. dead. Uh, yeah. Talk about the process of managing yeah. uh, a patient that has been um, found to have cholera. Okay, um, well, I'll start off by talking about its prevention, right? Because, you know, I believe most of the, the doctors already know what to do in the cases of cholera. Most important thing to tell people, you know, that are, you know, going to be viewing this right now, that are watching this right now is to prevent it in the first place, right? Uh, we want to make sure that they are taking whatever water they are ta taking, they properly boil it, and they store it safely, right? Another thing is to make sure that whatever food that they are eating is properly cooked. Um, they want to cook it thoroughly. They want to make sure they're also preparing it in a safe and in a clean environment. The other thing is to make sure that, uh, you know, people wash their fruits, their vegetable, whatever raw foods they are taking, you want to make sure you don't just, you know, pick it and start consuming. You want to make sure you wash it uh, thoroughly. People should also um, practice good hand hygiene, right? Wash your hands regularly, uh, sanitize your hands uh, when you need to. And for people to also avoid open defecation, okay? Uh, people, you know, the, the habits of, you know, just dumping, you know, um, excreta maybe close to water bodies or in water bodies should be eating of the parts, to be honest. And then um, patronizing just, you know, just any food you see on the road, you want to be careful with that because you don't even know, you know, the process that goes into preparing it. That being said, when it comes to the doctors and managing patients that, uh, you know, had uh, cholera uh, ongoing, our primary uh, thing that we're looking at is to replace the fluids the person is losing, right? Because the person is losing fluids and electrolytes. Uh, in this instance, let's just call them body chemicals. Yeah. So uh, the person is losing all this through either the stooling, which is frequent, which is profuse. Like I said, it's, it can get so bad that the person can actually pass on within some hours of developing, you know, um, acute symptoms of, of cholera. Right, uh, so you want to replace those fluids, and remember the person might, might be vomiting as well. So I uh, want to replace those fluids as soon as possible. We want to replace those electrolytes as soon as possible. That is the main thing that is going on in our mind because that is the primary thing that even kills people, right? Not just the infection in itself, it's the, it's the dehydration that comes with the infection. So I uh, want to make sure we, have, we manage that. Then of course we have our you know antimicrobial uh, therapies and other therapies that we use to you know support such patients that we have that we discover have a case of uh, cholera ongoing. Okay, Dr. Okafor, 
Um, mm -hmm. when, when we look at the um, statistics that the NCDC has put out their report, it says that Bauchi State has the highest number of cases, 566, mm -hmm. while Borno State mm -hmm. recorded the most deaths, that's 13, in the past week. But I want us to um, talk about the myth that cholera is, is a disease you can only get in the rural areas because we know about the prevalence of open defecation, people mm -hmm. pouring into bodies of water, and then people going mm -hmm. to the streams to use that water to drink and cook without properly washing and boiling. So we know about that. Mm -hmm. But there's also that misconception that, oh, I'm in an urban city like Lagos, I can't mm -hmm. get cholera. Um, you know, I want you to address that, especially with how our buildings are being constructed when your borehole is sited up and, the, you, you know, your, your borehole is sited down and then your mm -hmm. soccerway pit is sited up and the possibility of that seeping mm -hmm. in, into, your, into the water that you consume. Please tell us more about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is no question, there is no doubt that, uh, you know, cholera is more common in rural communities, right? And that is simply because, you know, access to clean water is is per se more common at this time in the urban cities, right? Access to facilities that process, you know, water, that decontaminate water is more common, more common in urban cities. But that being said, the possibility of having cholera is not a crisis involved. Right? As long as food that people are consuming is involved, there is always that possibility. So it's just the, height, uh, the responsibility of having a heightened sense of awareness of this disease, right? Especially now that it's an outbreak ongoing. People want to make sure that they do their possible best you know, to uh, prevent it in their own communities, to prevent it in their own families by taking care. Yet cases happen in urban centers. That is a fact, right? So. Uh, uh, it is. It is not even something that should be in anyone's mind. That that the sheer fact that they are staying maybe in Lagos, sheer fact that they are staying in, in you know an urban community that they are exempt from it. And just like you said, you know, bubbles needs to be cited at the appropriate places. Um, even the the uh, the process of you know of going to the toilets, right, of passing feces has to be done appropriately. The sewage that you know we produce. Um, has to be disposed properly, even in these urban centers. And you know, the urban centers have, you know, a more sewage uh, disposal rates than the others. So everything has to be in place, right? What is preventing the cholera is the appropriate practice that we take, not just the fact that we are in an urban center. All right. Um, is there also home um, remedies? Is there ways to manage a cholera patient at home? Um, or, you know, it, it, the case must be taken or the person must be taken to the hospital? Yeah, the person, once you have, uh, once you present with uh, a case of profuse diarrhea, that, we, that, you know, once you suspect you have cholera, there is no room for you to stay at home and manage it. No, you present to the hospital. The doctor will be the one to tell you, okay, you can take this, this, this at home. Right, but doctor will be the ones to assess you because someone could actually be on the brink of, you know, uh, kidney shutdown as a result of dehydration, and still think that they can manage it at home. Right, cholera is something that once it gets started, right, once you pre once once you start having clinical symptoms, it can get really, really bad, really, really quick. So you want the assessment and everything to be done in a hospital. The doctor will, will know whether he is admitting you. He will know whether you know, he's comfortable with saying, oh, okay, it's not gotten super bad so far that you can, you know, take so, so, so. And the doctor has to tell you what to take as well, right? Because it goes beyond you just buying some medications and maybe trying to drink water or something. No, there's much more to it than that. So every case of suspected cholera, we advise that the person gets medical attention as soon as possible. Okay, um, uh, my first question to you earlier was if Nigerians understand how serious this cholera situation is. Mm -hmm. And you just mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, the possibility of a kidney shutdown because of cholera. Can you tell us more about that? And, you know, the challenges that we might have mm -hmm. with, you know, internal organs, you know, when someone is diagnosed with cholera and they don't treat it fast. Oh, okay. It's, it's pretty simple, right? Once the, there is... Um, once there is dehydration ongoing in someone's body, once someone is not in, you know, having as much fluid as they should come into their body, and you know the kidney is primarily responsible for filtering 
you know, some of the uh, things that ought not to be in the body, right? Uh, and you need fluid to go through it regularly. Once that is not being done, once they that, that, you know, um, lack of supply of fluid to the necrosis, right? It's just, uh, you know, partial death of some parts of the kidney, and mm -hmm. uh, you would see uh, the kidney start to malfunction. It could go into an uh, acute, you could have something called acute kidney injury, which could progressively lead to, you know, a, a chronic kidney disease and other, you know, kidney uh, pathogenic manifestations. So uh, we just want to make sure, the most important thing that the population needs to know right now is that that dehydration, and have more consequences that they know, especially when they start feeling weak, right? That's a big, a big uh, thing for us, right? When someone that has been stewing a lot, you know, starts having, start feeling so weak that you know they don't even want to take water, or they don't want, to, they don't want to be fed orally at all. Mm -hmm. um, they just, they are just generally lethargic. You know, it, so uh, to everybody listening, it's, it's a pretty serious thing, right? It's not just that you're pooping more than usual. It is it is a, it's something that you need to get help immediately, get help as soon as possible. Don't try to wait it out at home. Don't try to enjoy it and see. Don't try to chest it and put, right? Just present and get care. It is something that once we start treating early, right, fatality rates, people that die is much, much less than 1%, right? Not even close. Not even close. But it is also something that without treatment, that's where we see high number of, of, of cases of, of deaths from this cholera go up. So it's pretty, cholera has been there for a long, long time, right? Even as early, there have been cases uh, that were described that are similar to, to cholera uh, as far back as, I think, 360 BC. So uh, it's, it's super, super important that, um, right. so it's not something that we're unaware of. It's not something that we're not be dealing with. So it's super important that people get uh, care for this, this right. thing that's um, persisted for this long. Dr. Kafo, finally, uh, quickly also share if there is any age group that is more at risk uh, to um, uh, fatality with regards to cholera. Okay. And also, you're, you know, once again, warning to Nigerians who are watching um, about the severity of this uh, disease and what must be done. Yeah, okay. So when it comes to, you know, age predisposition, uh, we see that most of the cases, especially in the country, right, according to the reports that we have from the NCD, NCDC that has been, you know, really uh, active with activities, you know, they've sent out uh, different uh, rapid response teams to the most affected communities, started uh, a cholera uh, emergency operation center just to help with surveillance, uh, detection, and immediate treatment. Um, the, sorry, one second. The ages that we see that are predisposed to this most is the, from five to 14 years, right? We see the most cases or the most affected people within that age range, five to 14 years, right? I remember these are children. Um, they need care as soon as possible. It's not something that their parents should just be watching and hoping for the best. It is something super serious. In children, it can go bad pretty, pretty quick, right? And uh, outcomes also in terms of uh, morbidity, in terms of, you know, fatality are worse, you know, in children. You know, than it is in adults. So, uh, cholera is something to, to be taken seriously, especially because of how it spreads, right? It's not, like I said, an adult can be asymptomatic. You may not show any symptoms. Someone may not even show any symptoms from having uh, uh, cholera, right? So, you might have, uh, let's say, a, a an asymptomatic parent preparing food regularly for the children. Right, and the children just everybody's just tuning and they're wondering what's going on. So, uh, having that in mind, it is important that we pay attention to all the prevention uh, methods that you know I mentioned earlier in the show, yeah. and uh, that we should also you know um, work towards you know eliminating this totally the best way that we can by following the the, the processes I mentioned. Everyone should right. be highly alert. There's an outbreak going on. Be highly alert about. Um, you know, the cholera outbreak that is ongoing, take adequate. Now is not the time for you to be drinking any kind of water. Now is not the time for you to be taking any kind of food, right? It doesn't, it may not show on the person's face. The person could be walking, could be cooking. In fact, in history, there, there's a popular case of that, you know, that I won't be able to go into details where one person 
just gave so many people without even uh, on, on on her. She had no symptoms whatsoever, right? But several people were dying as a result of this. So uh, let's oh, be careful. Let's up. wash our hands, our food properly, and take um, clean water. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Dr. Emmanuel Kafu, thank you very much for your time and thank for you. speaking with us. Um, and of course, I hope that the message has been mm -hmm. properly uh, spread you. and we wish you a great day ahead. Thank you again. You, thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Yes. And that's it on, on this edition of The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Uh, we've really had an interesting run uh, beginning with that police officer who was denied um, asylum in Canada because of his association with the Nigerian police force. All through to the Kogi prison break story. And now um, having a medical doctor share with us the importance of good hygiene uh, because of the increasing cases of cholera in Nigeria. Um, if you missed out on any part of the conversation, do follow us on all our social media platforms. We're at Plus TV Africa. I am Aneta Felix, asking you to have a great day. And I am Osao Gye Ogbawang.